So I'm gonna share a little bit here with you today on mostly highlighting one project using pain self-management in an opioid use disorder population. I have no conflicts of interest or disclosures related to this work. And I just wanna share some of the highlights from the work that I've done with my team here to help improve the identification and management of pain within the context of opioid use disorders. At the end of the session, you should be able to identify some potential gaps in symptom management for adults with opioid use disorders, and hopefully think about developing some strategies to integrate a more positive pain symptom management environment for people with opioid use disorder. The preceding case was really interesting to me because I think it's not only the pain symptoms, but the other symptoms that people with substance use disorders are carrying that sometimes gets less attention in certain treatment centers. And uh, my goal is to just shine some light on the fact that there's a lot of things going on in the substance use population related to symptom burden. And we must pay attention to that if we really wanna make some progress in, in improving outcomes, I believe. So when you think about pain and substance use, obviously people use substances because it's positively reinforcing. It's pleasant usually using alcohol, opioids, cannabis, benzodiazepines, they get that positive reinforcement. But I think what's less appreciated is there's also this negative reinforcements where you're relieving something negative, you're relieving the pain or the symptom when you're using those substances. So it's, it's doubly reinforcing to the brain. And when you have pain and substance use, that interacts in a feedback loop that can actually worsen both conditions over time. And as mentioned in the, in the prior session, the substance use can also cause pain or cause more symptoms, the withdrawal symptoms that you might experience, the hyperalgesia or more sensitivity to pain, and also chronicity of sleep and pain problems occur just from using the substance. So it's really a dysfunctional cycle that people can find themselves in. When we talk about the opioid conundrum and non-medical pain reliever use or opioid misuse, it's occurring at a pretty high rate. 12 and a half percent of those with an opioid prescription admit that they're using that opioid other than the way in which it was prescribed. So that would fall into this category of opioid misuse or non-medical pain reliever use. And about 10 million in the United States, 12 years or older, admit they misused prescription opioids in 2019. And every year that we check this, we still have people saying, yes, they misuse their prescription opioids. And when you ask them why, 62% uh, of the time, pretty consistently, more than half will say they're doing that to relieve their pain. So they're using opioids that are not their own. They're taking the opioids other than the way they were prescribed or they're using them for reasons other than which they were prescribed to relieve their physical pain. A smaller percentage of people will say they're misusing those opioids to help them relax or ease tension. And then a very small percentage will say they're doing that in order to feel good or get high. So I think it's important just to note that they tell you they're using it to relieve a symptom. And misuse can certainly signal some inadequate symptom control and also misuse can be a precursor to substance use disorder. So there's a whole list of behaviors that people may do when they're prescribed opioids for pain that will flag them as a person who's exhibiting some aberrant behaviors. But it's important to remember that sometimes those behaviors are triggered by inadequate symptom control. And that poor symptom control can trigger substance use. When we look at people who have a substance use disorder, whether it's alcohol, tobacco, cannabis, sedatives, opioids, more than half of them have a comorbid chronic pain condition. And within the opioid use disorder population, anywhere from 60 to 80%, depending what study you look at, endorse a chronic pain condition. So in addition to having the pain of withdrawal that may be occurring if they're entering treatment, they also often have some chronic pain and they may have limited access to pain management treatment. In fact, I started my research in chronic pain populations and I became very curious about the opioid use disorder populations because I knew that there were a lot of people that were having this overlap. They might have started out with a 
opioid prescription for pain reason, but now they were in treatment for opioid use disorder. And once they get into the opioid use disorder treatment program, they were being told, we don't manage pain here, or we don't do pain here. And what they meant by that was, we don't prescribe opioids to treat your pain here. We prescribe opioids to treat your substance use disorder. But I think that statement, we don't do pain here, is really doing a disservice to the population because their symptom management is part of their substance use problem in some cases. So we really can't separate those two things and say, we're just not gonna talk about that here. I have come to believe through several studies working with this population, there's a high need for non-pharmacologic pain and other symptom management options within this population. And when we talk about people that are moving from a pain condition to opioid use disorder, the statistics are pretty messy and it's hard to know for sure, but it looks like about anywhere from 15 to 26% will misuse opioids and then about 8% may become truly addicted or have a substance use disorder. But we don't really understand too well how people move from that appropriate use of opioids for pain into needing an opioid use disorder treatment. In the past, when I started in my nursing career, and I was working in hospitals, did a lot of work with people in oncology, and the biggest concern from patients was often whether they were going to become addicted to their opioids. And we were taught to tell them, if you take opioids for pain, you can't become addicted. Well, now we know that's probably not true, and we probably don't have to encourage people to keep taking opioids when they're having pain until the pain is completely gone. We know that it's okay to tolerate a little bit of pain, you know, in recovery after a surgery, for example. But in the past, this is the, the teaching that was going out there from nurses and probably some providers to, um, to patients. So it was confusing. We now know that there is an increased risk of opioid use disorder when you have an increased opioid dose. We also know that variables like your genetics, other comorbid psychiatric disorders, your age, if you're a younger age, social family environments or childhood trauma can also increase that risk of developing an opioid use disorder if you have pain. But what about symptoms? I feel like that's still underappreciated when we're talking about who is at increased risk of developing an opioid use disorder. So a study I did a few years back, we looked at this online pain self-management program that we had tested in a chronic pain population. And now we wanted to move it into this new population of people with medication for addiction treatment in an outpatient treatment program and see if they would have any benefit. Another real motivation for doing this study was applying some screening tools to the population and to see what their symptom burden was. We recruited 60 people who had opioid use disorder and coexisting chronic pain. And we really wanted to know how well their needs for chronic pain management were being met while they were in this medication addiction treatment program. And there's a full paper on that. I'm happy to share if you want to read that. Just send me an email. The majority of participants reported that their first use of opioids was in response to a painful event. And I'm just going to give you a snapshot of what we learned about their symptoms, both at the baseline and eight weeks later on the post test, all of them reported a moderate level of pain, anywhere from five to six on the zero to 10 scale. So both their pain severity and their pain interference were not greatly improved over time, and they were carrying a pretty significant level of pain all of the time. When we looked at their depressive symptoms, again, most of them, most of the time, were falling into categories of moderate depressive symptoms on the PHQ-8, which is how we measured that. Um, Post-test, there wasn't much difference from baseline to eight weeks later. Their depressive symptoms stayed pretty consistent in both the treatment and the control. In anxiety, most of the participants were having at least moderate anxiety. Many of them had a pretty high level of anxiety falling into the severe range, um, but on baseline and post-treatment, most of them were above a moderate level of anxiety using the GAD-7. The adjective rating scale for withdrawal 
the ARSW. This is how we looked at how much withdrawal symptoms they were carrying around. And again, from pre to post, most of them were carrying a pretty heavy burden of withdrawal symptoms. And we looked at this in comparison to other published norms using the ARSW and our population of about 60 participants were higher on average than what was in the published literature for people in medication assisted treatment, which ran about a 28 to a 65 on the ARSW. Ours, um, the treatment group was on average almost 72, which was a bit higher. And then after the eight weeks, they all reduced somewhat, but they were still carrying a pretty heavy burden. So a question that this brought to my mind was whether the withdrawal symptoms might be actually worse for people with comorbid chronic pain and who are having treatment for opioid use disorder. And it would make sense that that would be the case because a lot of the questions on the ARSW do ask about pain and it doesn't necessarily distinguish between chronic pain or acute pain that may be associated with withdrawal. So in any case, they looked like from the data we were collecting at least that they were fairly uncomfortable a lot of the time, even though they were receiving treatment every day, many of them going into the clinic and being seen by clinicians and receiving their dose of methadone, um, they still were carrying a pretty heavy load of burden of symptoms. The opioid misuse scale we used, the COM, a greater than nine on this indicates misuse. And across the eight weeks period, all of our participants were measuring to be into the misuse category above the 14, 14 to 16 on average. That wasn't really surprising. The COM, I don't think was really meant to be used in an opioid use disorder population. So that's something to consider. It's generally used in a chronic pain population. Then pain self-efficacy or how confident they felt about managing their pain symptoms. These scores compared to other studies that I've done with people with just chronic pain, these were a little bit lower and I thought that was interesting. So on average, the people in our study were less confident about their ability to manage their pain symptoms than others. And over time in the treatment group, you can see there was a trend to towards increasing that pain self-efficacy score. And that is something that we would expect with the pain self-management program, because a big part of the content is about helping them learn ways to manage their symptoms. So this was positive. We dug in a little deeper to that adjective rating scale for withdrawal to see what some of the most common symptoms were that they were um, rating highly. And this has a scale of a zero to nine. So for these items that you see on the screen, the muscle cramps, painful joints, trouble getting to sleep, irritable and fitful sleep, those were all above a five on average on the pretest. There was some decrease on the post-test, but I pulled these out because I thought this might be really driving those higher withdrawal symptoms. And it's good to know what are the things that are most uncomfortable to the people in this population. And it certainly looks like pain and sleep are a big deal. And we use these data really to justify some further studies that we've started to do, looking more at the sleep associated with people in opioid use disorder treatment. Again, knowing many of them say they're taking substances to help them with their sleep, so if you're going to have successful recovery, you're probably going to have to address that need for sleep. We did end up doing a linear regression, controlling for age, gender, baseline values, program engagement with the study. And we found that those who actually engaged in the online program did improve their pain interference, their pain severity, their opioid misuse, and their depressive symptoms compared to those who did not engage. So in the treatment group, we had a number of people that really just didn't do too much on the online program, which was not a real surprise. Um, we did offer them some guidance and support, but it requires sitting at a computer and some of the participants had frankly never even used a computer before. So, um, you know, it wasn't the best intervention. We didn't expect it to be for this group, but we wanted to just learn more and test how the intervention would be received. Um, I think if we offered them more encouragement, maybe some rewards for participating and more accountability, um, and ideally integrating this kind of programming into the clinic, 
flow uh, would be ideal. You know, we were coming in as outsiders, researchers, asking them to engage. But if it was something that was offered as part of their treatment, uh, I think it could have been pretty powerful. You can also take the content out of the online program and just deliver in a group setting. And we've done a little bit of that and have had some success with that. Obviously, these high physical and emotional symptom burdens can interfere with the treatment goals. We looked at a subsample of people in the study and did some intensive interviews and have another paper that details a little bit more what they told us about their journey from opioid initiation to substance use treatment. And I'm happy to share that if anyone wants to read that paper in full. So the bottom line, when you're talking about pain management essentials, no matter what kind of population you're dealing with, it really requires some investment of time to do a good pain assessment. It's definitely going to take more than five minutes. So I encourage people in clinical settings to think about what kind of strategies they can come up with to information gather and share. The standardized surveys that we use in research are great for collecting data and understanding more about symptom burdens, but you probably need to designate some human resources to listen to the pain story so that person really feels listened to and understood. We, we know, especially in the opioid use disorder population, they have complex pain histories, complex medical histories often, and past traumas are very common. So they really need some time to be able to tell their pain story. Strategies like using peer counselors or volunteers, pain certified nurses such as myself, or get some certification if you have nurses that are not certified, um, using students or interns or case managers, but people who will really designate some time to listen and understand more about the kinds of pain that they're experiencing. There's definitely a tangled web of physical and emotional pain in this population. So it just is going to need some investment of time. But when you're measuring pain, if you can think to move beyond the pain intensity zero to 10 scale, I would encourage that because you can really find out a lot more about how that pain is impacting people if you just measure it a little more holistically. So I have here on the screen a snapshot of the brief pain inter inventory, for example, and this is measuring pain interference, asking how the pain interferes with activity, mood, relationships, etc. Really important to understand a little bit more about how it's interfering. The functional pain scale is another nice tool where you can ask about how the person's tolerating their activities in relation to their pain or symptoms. Collecting data on things like anxiety and depression is important. PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, is a really important thing to look at in this population. Looking at their opiate, opiate withdrawals, how well that's managed. It's really hard to get that well managed, especially when you're onboarding people. Um, adverse childhood events should be looked at. Their spiritual health, their quality of life. Definitely suicidality has to be assessed when you're sending people home with a handful of opioids. That's really important. And then the sleep. So there's so many things you need to understand about the individual that, again, a five minute interview is probably not going to be sufficient. I do think we can offer people options and hope. Pain self-management programs are not easy, is a process, not a quick fix. So it's not something that's gonna be fixed in one visit with one prescription, it's going to take time. These online programs are great for having some standardized information available that clinicians can use if they're not well-versed in pain self-management. Doing things like shared medical appointments, we've done some experimentation with that. We've used uh, Dr. Beverly Thorne's LAMP program, which is for low literacy audiences and created some groups out of that content. That's a wonderful way to deliver pain self-management content. Some people can be very self-directed. You could give them a web program and they might be fine, but many people really are going to need more guidance. Certainly pain psychologists who specialize in pain or CBT are a wonderful resource, but I have found very few people in the opioid use disorder treatment programs have had access to that kind of care. So there is a gap. Um, Finally, complementary and integrative medicine options are really important to offer. Having this combined approach where they have some medicine and also have the multimodal treatment is thought to be 
quite necessary now, particularly with chronic pain. You know, we really need a combination of techniques to address the multiple mechanisms of the pain relief. And I think especially for people with opioid use disorder, there's a lot of things going on in their body physically. And so one pill is probably not going to fix everything. That is my biased opinion. Um, these should not be considered as alternatives to the medicine, but a combined approach. And some of these things like yoga, massage, tai chi, that helps address the need for a biopsychosocial spiritual approach to pain care that is often not being delivered to people in opioid use disorder treatment. Uh, recently, we've done some work with hyperbaric oxygen therapy that's been really encouraging. I would be happy to come back and talk more about that at another time. But I just wanna leave today with a reminder that these symptoms I'm talking about, whether it's pain, anxiety, depression, sleep, mood, it's not insignificant to their recovery. As one person was quoted as saying in an article uh, a few years ago, when their last dose of drugs starts to wear off, they'll take anything to avoid withdrawal, which they describe as the flu on steroids with fever, vomiting, diarrhea, and high anxiety. Uh, symptoms can really trigger some poor outcomes. And so I will leave it at that. My contact information is on the screen. You can find me at the Washington State University College of Nursing in Spokane. And I'm happy to entertain any questions or comments. And I do have a list of references I can share. And you should see them actually in the, in the handout. So let me turn off my PowerPoint. Great. Thanks so much, Dr. Wilson. Really appreciate it. Um, what questions do folks have? You can either put them up in the chat, which I can keep an eye on, or expect we can um, let folks unmute and bring in their questions, by the way. But one part of patient stories that I was wondering a little about if it came up in your work was uh, sort of that like evolution into use disorder when it was discovered and how patients with whom you had contact kind of experienced that. And, you know, I'm kind of asking that question from the perspective of someone, you know, in family medicine and, and sometimes I think there can be some really challenging kind of interactions with the healthcare system for folks and just wondering what kind of stories you've sort of heard along those lines that that might inform kind of providers around you know pitfalls and maybe miss or missed diagnoses along those lines yeah the qualitative study i mentioned i encourage you to read that the the bottom line what the people were telling us is the healthcare providers really make or break their experience and both positive and negative. So they shared some negative things that would happen. For example, they have a true pain problem, even a crisis, a new acute pain injury. And the provider may say to them, well, you know, let me just tell you off the bat, you're not getting anything from me, meaning I'm not giving you any opioids because I know you have a substance use problem. So hurtful, so inappropriate, but you know, those kinds of stories we hear a lot. And then on the flip side, they talk about how the provider really made a difference in them entering recovery programs. You know, providers who said, hey, there's no question here, you're starting the methadone program and pushed them into taking charge when they were in a dangerous, scary situation using heroin on the street to manage their pain for example, which we did hear of a bit. Um, so I think just remembering that your role as a provider is so influential, both to the positive and to the negative, and the stories of the patients are so powerful. And um, yeah, I'm happy to share, if you haven't looked at that other article, the qualitative study, uh, we were really moved by what the, what the participants had to tell us. I'd like to uh, thank you for your presentation. And I have seen a lot of providers, you know, be more accommodating and helping their patients out. My uh, opioid use disorder started in 1998 and it did start from a severe back injury with pain. So that's how I got introduced to uh, hydrocodone. Uh, it started out kind of slow, couple 350 milligram, whatever. Um, 
and then it just kind of spiraled out of control. The pain started getting worse, and then I started to feel good at work from having it. I could function. And then before I knew it, the start of my shift, I was taking 10 of the 750s just to get going at work, which was in turn, you know, I didn't feel the pain, so I'm sure I was making the injury worse. And other injuries appeared, and I went to my doctor, and it was stigma and shame, and you have a problem, you're not getting anything else. And that's when I turned to heroin. And that's how I controlled my pain for years. And so thank you for your presentation and your work. It means a lot to me. And this is Sheila. Um, so we have uh, clinics up in the northern part of the state. And consistent with what you have in your data, what we see is where at times our providers are really needing to advocate for our patients because they have something going on, but because of their substance use disorder diagnosis, they may not be looked at the same as someone who comes in without that diagnosis. So we've had things like um, abscesses on the spine and all kinds of other things that, uh, yeah, that our providers end up having to advocate to get the people looked at. Or we start ordering tests that are a little outside of our purview, and then we get something done. So your your point about the provider's uh, interaction is, is huge. Um, it, it makes all the difference in the world for these folks. And, People having substance use disorders get sick. They have stuff happen. They have cancers. They have um, multiple other diagnoses. So that's probably the, the strongest message that, that we feel needs to be out there is to really look at the patient in front of you, not your perception of the patient. Yeah, thank you both for that, for those comments. So true. Any other comments or questions? Um, hi, am I, am I on? Hi. Yes. I guess I'm yes. Oh, okay. Hi. It's Beth Lindner. Yes. I really appreciate the bio, psycho, social, spiritual, um, aspect that you mentioned that just sounds so right. Um, and I guess the other thing, you know, I, I don't have a big clinic, but I sure can imagine mm -hmm. providers get overwhelmed with, um, you know, many, many demands, not enough time, et cetera, et cetera, kind of that story. And the patient sometimes gets lost there. So, yeah, beautiful data that you presented. Thank you. Thank you. I think one of the things I've been most encouraged by are the peer led programs where people who have had chronic pain and a comorbid substance use, um, those are really powerful because they can be understood. And a lot of people, especially if they've started with the pain condition and ended up in a addiction yeah. treatment program, they feel so misunderstood. They're like, my situation is special here. You know, I, I had a pain problem. I wasn't just out on the street finding heroin. So I'm, I have special, um, a special history here and feeling understood and listened to about that is, you know, it's just, it does, it takes time. And I feel like we should make sure there is some time spent in that feeling understood, empathizing, you know, we can't underestimate the value of those um, treatment, pieces of treatment, really. 